like to call the meeting to order the regular board meeting for the Greenview Board of Education for Thursday, November 19th, 2020. Call the roll. Suzanne Arthur? Here. Todd Ireland? Here. Scott Powers? Present. Angela Reagan? Here. Teresa Wallace? Here. We have a quorum. Would you want me to pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay. We won't have any uh, public participation this evening, I don't think. Yep, there's no public participation today. Okay. All right. Uh, to approve agenda, any changes to the agenda? There is an addendum. Yes. Uh, superintendent update was added. Okay. Um, and then there was one other little change under personnel six, item C, Chase Jordan is a volunteer high school wrestling he's not bowling so high school wrestling okay. yeah all right do i have a motion i'll second all right angela reagan yes todd ireland yes scott powers yeah Teresa wallace yes suzanne arthur yes motion passed five to zero free the treasury report one approve the minutes uh, from the regular board meeting October 26, 2020. Two approve the October financial reports. Three approve the five year forecast as presented. Four approve the following student activity budget and purpose statements A class of 2021, B class of 2022, and C National Honor Society. I'll go over the, I have a presentation on the five-year forecast. Um, and then you guys all have the five-year forecast in front of you. Mm -hmm. oh, I can't really think about this. I normally have the board where they can see it. So but. you should have a copy of this. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And a lot of the things inside of there are yep. what he's referring to. <clears throat> and you should have a copy of the five-year forecast as well. Yes. And then he yeah. sent it out also, so yeah. we had a chance to preview it. Okay, yes. Okay, um, so uh, the five-year forecast is mostly good news compared to uh, <clears throat> where we ended in May of 2020. Um, things were not as, as bad financially as we had originally anticipated. So uh, we have our real estate reappraisal for 2020 um, and there was increases in the values of the district. So that's, that's good. Um, now we're seeing some with with that. There there are some delinquents. Um, there's a lot more delinquents this year because of COVID. Um, people just aren't paying their taxes on time. That money's still collectible. So if the values are up and the housing market is still strong, so um, that's good. And so we should see a little bit more income from real estate taxes. Uh, the income tax is expected to decrease by 2% in FY21 due to COVID-19. That's what we saw in May, so that has not changed. Um, and then we don't have an increase in state basic aid. And the, um, the cuts in aid um, were 5.01% in FY21. That's actually half of what we thought it would be. Um, when we were looking at it in May, we were expecting a 10% cut, um, but we were going to get what we got in 2020, but that is still um, a 5% cut from that floor that we were stuck at. Um, I don't know if you're, you're on the slideshow there. So, I'm on the slideshow here. Yep. Yeah. Um, so the revenue versus expenditures, um, you can see that uh, expenditures is the red line and revenues is the blue line there. And then our cash balance is the green line at the bottom. Um, we have been in a deficit spending cycle um, since really uh, FY19 and forward, we've been um, deficit spending. So we are now um, seeing that cash balance drop. But 
in May, we were looking at a negative cash balance at the end of 2023. And now we're not really seeing a negative cash balance until 2025. We're just barely um, in the black at the end of fiscal year 2024. Um, but that's going with, you know, some of the parameters that we have in here that, um, you know, not looking at base increases for our salaries and stuff. So, so this is a um, conservative estimate. You'll move on to the ending cash balance slide. Um, again, this is better than in May 2020, but um, we're still in trouble by the end of fiscal year 2024. Um, you know, we barely have a unreserved cash balance in 2024, just 320,000. So, you know, it'd be a good idea to start talking about revenues before then. Um, and then you know, just everything's very uncertain with the COVID-19 response and the cost of that response. So we are getting some assistance from the federal government on that, but we've actually lost more revenues than assistance we're getting. And then um, I have been looking at, you know, the actual supply cost of dealing with COVID. Desk, mask, hand sanitizer, things like that, um, you know, dealing with the actual response. But I would say our biggest cost from COVID is actually going to be um, additional salaries for teachers who are teaching in buildings. And then they're also helping with our online learning program. So we all those supplementals that we agreed to pay for teachers helping with the, the online learning, that's probably going to be our biggest cost from COVID. Um, and then all the benefits that go with that. Um, the next is a pie chart estimated general fund revenues by source. Um, hasn't really changed very much. Uh, it, the biggest change is um, our revenues from the state are 41.95%, and that's down about 1% from the prior year. And then you can go ahead to the district enrollment slide. So one of the things that's interesting, you know, it points out here, district enrollment in FY um, 2008 was 1,438. And in 2021, we're looking at 1,386 students. So a loss of 52 students in, in 13 years. That really goes back to that 2007 housing bubble. Um, when they built the middle school, they're anticipating, you know, that neighborhood going in over here. And there's, you know, some some building projects that they thought were going to happen in the district. And, you know, after that housing market bubble popped, then, you know, we haven't really seen the enrollment come back. But we are starting to see enrollment go back up in just like the last couple of years. Um, One of the things that notice, um, and you guys don't have this on the little spreadsheet that you have, but it was in the presentation. ADM is the average daily membership. So that's looking at how many kids are here for a full FTE, a full-time equivalent. Um, enrollment is how many kids, how many, how many Jimmy's and, and Sally's do we have? And the ADM is how many, how, what part of the year are they here for the full time? And so our ADM is lower than our enrollment. If you'll see on the, on the, the chart that you have, um, one of the things that's happening right now in Columbus and we're, we're advocating for this um, is a fair funding formula. And it actually looks at enrollment as opposed to ADM because we have to educate those kids, even if they're, you have to account for those kids, even if they're not here every day, giving us a full-time equivalent. And so um, we're trying to, trying to advocate for some uh, different funding model out of the state. And then it has to do with part of it. So if you see that on the chart, what's the difference between enrollment and ADM is um, you know, based off of attendance, based off of partial year that they're here, things like that. So um, I'll keep you up to date, you know, how that fair funding thing is happening. It's hopefully we'll get a, a vote here in the next um, week or two, so. Yeah, um, and, and with that, I, I would say, you know, that difference between ADM and enrollment are actually probably some of the most expensive kids for a district um, because those are kids that are struggling with attendance or, you know, might be with a family that's 
just moving around a lot. And so, you know, you're getting them from somewhere else or they're only spending a partial year there. So it is um, expensive to get those kids caught up to where they should be. And um, so that's one of the, the benefits of looking at enrollment numbers as opposed to ADM. For what it's worth in their fair funding model, we would have about $500,000 additional revenue a year from the state um, in that type of system. Um, so that's you know, obviously a good thing for us. All right, go on to expenditures. So if you look at that pie chart that breaks down our general fund expenditures, you'll see um, roughly half of that is our wages. And then almost a quarter of it is our benefits. Then we have services, which is utilities, and it could be um, purchase services for personnel, um, like um, preschool or like food service, um, stuff like that. Um, we have capital outlay, which is just a small portion in our general fund and the materials. So our wages and our benefits make up 74.03%, which is late, less than the state average. State average is almost 75%, but you know, being really close to the state average just shows that Somebody's we're in the right place. <laughs> you know, we work all, all the time. Um, <laughs> it rolls from one thing. <laughs> it, works just like it rolls from one phone to the next. So we got a little bit of a stereo effect. Sorry for those of you who hear a phone ringing. So there's the, the general fund expenditures by, by that. Uh, if you go to the next chart, the next chart is uh, taking that pie graph and just breaking it, you know, putting it into bars and looking at our expenses over the next five years and, and the three prior years. Um, and you, the main thing with that is just that you see that expenditures are increasing annually. Um, we see about 2% increases in salaries every year. Right now, our benefits are, are growing. Um, we we were a little bit below what we had anticipated as far as the increase in health care costs. We had anticipated 10%. That's what we've been told the budget for. We got seven and a half last year. Um, with that, the, the EPC had, they didn't have a lot of time. And then COVID also really threw off the numbers for, for health care in 2020 because that was, you know, they were looking at our numbers from January forward, and then in March, they canceled all, you know, procedures that weren't deemed necessary and all this stuff. So the EPC just, um, you know, it was a little bit of an estimate to just go with seven and a half percent, but that's still better than the 10% that they've told us to anticipate in the future. Um, and then just those expenditures increasing um, annually and, you um, you know, we're seeing two years of, of losses in revenue. FY20, we're, we had a loss of revenue compared to FY19. FY21, we're expecting a loss in revenue compared to FY19 as well. We're not seeing our revenues increase again until fiscal year 2022. Um, it's a little bit better than what they had anticipated with the initial, um, you know, uh, May, 2020 outlook, you know, of COVID, we expect to see losses into 2022, but the uh, the income tax loss wasn't as bad as they anticipated. The state revenue loss wasn't as bad as they anticipated, but it is still really up in the air right now. Um, you know, as we're seeing COVID cases spike, um, it's really a matter of opinion how long this is going to last and when things will return to normal. So yeah, um, one of the things I pointed out, you can see the declining cash balance from fiscal year 19 moving forward is when we really start to see. They've been, been we've been kicking that can down the road, but it, it started to happen in, in 2019 and it continues until, um, until we look at some new revenue sources. Let's go to the, the summary. Oh. All right. So real estate taxes are expected to increase with the next reappraisal that, that's happened. Um, so again, they, you know, I talked about this a little bit, but um, we may not see that income right away because of the delinquents due to um, the circumstances right now, but that's still collectible. Um, that's, that's still money that's gonna come in no matter what in the future. Um, 
Income tax is, still has that 2% decrease for fiscal year 2021. Um, it's not as bad as we thought it would be, but it, it's right on where the projections were in May. Uh, the state funding has been reduced due to the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, long term, you know, we're keeping an eye on the state budgets, the state funding model that Isaac was, you, you know, touched on there. Um, a lot of this is, is out of our control. It's in the, the state legislator's hands, um, but that we just watch and wait and see what happens with that. Um, and then we have a positive cash balance until fiscal year 23. Um, it's one year better than last year, so that's um, that's really good. But um, you know, it, it's still there's a lot of stuff up in the air right now as far as predicting. Uh, we did one of the the best things on here compared to May is if you see there is that funding line that's down 11.01 .01 income tax renewal. We passed our renewal, so. Thank you, everyone who voted yes for Greenview Schools. Um, but we and we won't have to go out for that again. That's now a permanent levy. Um, that money's going to stay there. We've had it for the last 20 years, so why not forever? Um, but that that is probably the best news on our five-year forecast is the passing that um, income tax renewal and making it permanent, so that you know we're not going out to keep the money that we have in the future. Um, Again, th that that income tax renewal was there was no new taxes with that. It's just maintaining the income that the district has had. But you know, it, it's good to lock that down so that we're not um, guessing whether or not we're going to lose a million dollars in 2023. Now we know that money is going to be there. Are there any questions about the five-year forecast? Thank you. Welcome. Okay. No questions. Do I have a motion? Move. I'll second. All right. Angela Reagan? Yes. Todd Ireland? Yes. Scott Powers? Yeah. Teresa Wallace? Yes. Suzanne <laughs> Arthur? Yes. Motion passed five to zero. Over new business one approve the revised records retention schedules and disposal processes suggested by the Ohio Auditor of State and Ohio Historical Society. Two approve the certificate of disposal form RC3 pending approval of, a, of above mentioned records retention schedule by the Ohio Auditor of State and Ohio Historical Society. No motion. Hello. I'll second. Any questions? Do you want to clarification? I'm going to clarify what that is. We are good. With so that. there's a re record retention schedule. Um, it says, you know, it, it depends on what type of record it is, but you have to maintain it for a certain amount of time. After that time has passed, you're allowed to dispose of these records. Um, I will admit I am a uh, typical Green, Greenview employee, and I'm a bit of a hoarder. So I, I do not like to get rid of records. But, uh, since we moved back here, our record room is full. There is a lot of stuff that's back there. We, we do not use it regularly um, or we don't really need it at all. So um, so the, the ladies have gone through and, and cleaned up our, our records um, in the back and gone through the retention record and we're, we're getting rid of the things that are eligible to Just be curious, there. what's what's required for school? Oh, yeah, and some things are seven years. Some, some things, things are five. Some things are seven. Some, some things are ten. Some things are forever. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, we actually just had a really interesting forever thing come up. Um, we pay our special ed teachers a four hundred dollars stipend, and the auditor said, "Well, why do you do this?" I don't know. We've always done this goes back to a board meeting in 1981. Marsha was able to dig that out and, and find it out. So I, you know, I, I owe a big uh, hand to Marsha for, for digging that out. But yeah. there, yeah. That's your graduating year, Todd. That's my year. <laughs> <laughs> the things that we were, the things we're talking about in this records disposal um, are like deposit slips and cash receipts from 2000 and 12 to 2015, um, 
invoices from 2006 to 2008. Uh, you know, it, it's things that are well beyond, um, you know, probably what we even have those, some of those things. So, um, you know, that's, that's the type of thing, transportation reports, stuff that are no longer needed. Yeah. Um, two reports. Um, yeah. yeah. So they've been audited. Right. They're then, then at one point in time, we were going to look at scanning all that stuff. So we we've looked at digitizing some of our records and there's some, yeah, yeah, you know, there's some things that should be digitized. Like it would be nice if we had those board minutes digitized, then you could you search, know, search through a well, hundred years. I, I stuff. guess my question could also be maybe we just, you know, the records hold from this point back, but search to see about digitizing a certain point going forward. Um, right now, all of our invoices. Um, since we've been with SEU, everything has been digitized. So our invoices for the last purchase probably orders, five. Yeah. Um, five years. So you can look at <clears throat> the whole invoice package, um, check, invoice, purchase order. Everything's digitized and, and you can look at it all in one place. Um, and then USAS DW is more yeah. of our. Um, our data warehouse is more of our financial system, which the state is getting ready with them. We're supposed to go to that this summer. We'll see if that, that happens with COVID. I don't know if we're still on time with Nebecca. Um, we use a very ancient financial system that's uh, command key. I really like it, but I'm, I'm weird. Like... <laughs> yeah, uh, so it, um, yeah, somebody that works for the state, they said when they started 20 years ago, they talked about, they're like, oh, we're going to come out with a new financial system. That was 20 years ago. And, and so now we're finally seeing it happen. But, um, but yeah, I think, Ash, you know, just from you work at the auditor's office, I wouldn't keep anything unless, you know, any longer, I, you know, any longer than the state, you know, mandates. I mean, it's just so fabulous purging, you know, the old crap and <laughs> getting all that extra. Well, we have boxes of we have boxes of records and some things we can never get rid of back there, you know. And so um, just moving things, our office are, are open now. And so we don't have a room just for for file cabinets like we did. We try to get things into our storage room, which means that we now have file cabinets with boxes piled to the ceiling. And so we're, we're trying to make it uh, at least get back in line where we should be. Um, yeah. It's been a while yeah. since we've done this. I mean, so. Yeah, a little bit of work purging it all. And then what is just shredded or whatever. Right? Yeah. Yeah. We have a we have a, uh, a contract with somebody that will come pick it up. It's in a secure tote and then they shred it. So but that is great. Marshall, they have to go back 40 years. 1981. <laughs> uh, you said it was your graduation year, uh, Mr. Ireland. That was uh, the board resolution was passed three days before I was born. Um, <laughs> so just so we're all on the same page. Uh, <laughs> Smart elf. <laughs> we have a motion. <laughs> we, we have moved. So. Uh, Arthur, uh, Crossway, Turner, my dad. 1981. I think all five of those. Yeah. So. <laughs> I was in eighth grade. Angela Reagan. Yes. Todd Ireland. Yes. Scott Powers. Yeah. Teresa Wallace. Yes. Suzanne Arthur. Yes. Motion passed five to zero. So regardless of where we were, probably only one of them must be a spot. Yeah. Jeez. All kinds of grief here. Moving on to personnel. Uh, one, approve the following classified substitutes for the 2020-21 school year. A custodian, Amy Ballard, Nikki Butts, B aide, Brooklyn Dean, Nikki Butts. To accept the resignation of Diane Nestor due to retirement teacher at the elementary school effective May 28, 2021. Three, accept the resignation of Anna Betts, building aide at the elementary school effective November 24, 2020. Four, approve the transfer of Samantha Bennett to classroom aide, step one, effective November 30th, 2020, for the 2020 21 school year. Approve the following supplemental contracts for the 2020-2021 school year. A. Danny Webb, middle school boys basketball coach. B. Jesse Anderson, middle school wrestling assistant coach. Six, approve the following volunteer coaches for the 2020-2021 school year. Shane Nolly, high school bowling. 
Brian Brenneman High School Bowling, and Chase Jordan High School Wrestling. Have a motion? I'll move. I'll second. Any discussion? Angela Reagan? Yes. Todd Ireland? Yes. Scott Powers? Yeah. Teresa Wallace? Yes. Suzanne Arthur? Yes. Motion passed, five to zero. Next is uh, executive session. Oh, One of the oh, oh. the That's right. Covered it up a little bit. Right. That's what I did. There it is. That's okay, so we have slides. addendum. We've got the superintendent update, a COVID-19 update, and the second semester planning. So I put some more details on the slide show for um, people to see and follow along, but I wanted to give you an update on where things are right now. Talk a little bit about our middle school um, decision um, this week and what, what's happening going forward. So first, in terms of COVID-19, um, currently across the district, we sit at five positive cases, um, <clears throat> one student and four staff members. And... Um, the majority of them, actually, we just had another one today, so we're at six. We just had another one this evening that we were notified of, two students and um, four staff members. Um, the majority of those cases are at the middle school, um, and our, uh, we have one case at the high school, uh, a student uh, case. So um, all in all, I mean, we've, done a, we've done a really good job. Um, our folks have done an excellent job of um, – following the guidelines, the mandates, things like that. When we talk to superintendents and other administrators there, you know, prior to this week, we had six total for the year. Um, so we have six this week. Uh, so that's an indication of what we're seeing right now. Um, I can tell you that several of those staff member situations, um, you know, they, somebody else in their family was sick first and they became sick while while on quarantine. So, you know, that's not necessarily something they that they got during school. Um, yeah. When it comes that way, you're able to trace it a little bit when you when you start seeing that data. Um, and so that is um, that's something that you know we, we've done a really good job. We're trying to find a way to to stop the spread right now. Um, this week we made the decision on middle school. Um, we had a multiple num we had multiple numbers of staff members that were already out on quarantine because of exposure outside of school, and then we had one positive case um, in the building with a staff member, and three other staff members had to quarantine. So we, we got to the play point where we didn't have enough subs to cover the vacancies in that one building. Um, we ultimately made the decision because we felt like that that was going to stress us as a district in terms of our staffing. And if we had somebody in, you know, one person in another building became sick, then we wouldn't be able to fill that vacancy when really the burden was back at the middle school. And so um, in an effort to keep the other two going and have some access to subs, um, we, we, we made that decision. Now, since we've been out for two days, um, three days now, you know, we've had two other positive cases of staff members that have been reported um, since, since we've been out, that they were you know, they were out of school in quarantine and they've become sick while out of school. And so um, we're, we're, doing a, we're doing a really good job. We've got to, you know, kind of refocus ourselves at the middle school. Um, you know, what, are there, is there any explanation for some of this in one building and from then the others? You know, those are things we have to look at and just see, um, you know, do we need to adjust, do we need to adjust our, our habits there? Um, do we need to adjust what we're doing. Um, so we're going to be, you know, we're going to be making the decision um, by tomorrow at noon. Mrs. Callowert and I have decided we will talk tomorrow at noon, look at our current number of staff members, anybody that we are, you know, that we're currently waiting on test results for or anything like that, and see do we have enough staff to be able to come back to school on Monday and Tuesday next week. Um, even with those numbers at the middle school, um, I think we have, and this is, I'm playing from memory, 33 students quarantined at the middle school as a result of the teacher staff uh, positive, the student staff positive, you know, 33 students 
out of you know 400 um, is not awful. Um, we've we've been in that situation before. Um, but in talking with the health department this afternoon, having four positive cases in one building um, puts us in a place where um, we will be added to a list with the health department um, that they consider that an outbreak um, because those four positive cases are not from the same family. Um, and so they, they consider it to be widespread, um, you know, widespread at that point in time. Um, you know, because of the, po the positives we know about, what are the positives we don't know about? And so those are things that we'll take into consideration as we continue to make decisions. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we can get our parents, our families, uh, an answer tomorrow afternoon so they could plan for what Monday and Tuesday would look like. Will we be in person or will we be virtual? So that's about those two things, is there any questions? or Clarifying, that's the middle school. The middle school. I just want to make sure they heard it. Yeah, so the middle school. So elementary right now, um, we have students out on quarantine because of exposure outside of school. But at the elementary currently, um, I'm not aware uh, of any positive cases um, that, you know, they may have been reported later today, you know, type of thing. But um, the high school, we have one student who's positive at the high school. And so those buildings are in pretty good shape. You know, while we have students that are quarantined, um, we're not, uh, we don't have positive cases. For example, our JV basketball team is, uh, the entire team is quarantined. We played a scrimmage last Saturday against an opponent that had a kid that was sick while we played. Um, and so we, we watched about three minutes of fo footage and we realized he touched every kid on the floor in that short period of time. And the CDC guideline is during physical activity um, any contact is close contact. You're breathing heavy, you're sweating. Both people are, you know, interacting that way. So our entire JV team has a 14 day quarantine from quarantine from basketball. Is he showing signs? This, uh... Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, after the scrimmage went home and didn't feel well enough okay. that they got tested Saturday evening, but before the scrimmage, you know, I don't know how he felt. So um, those are things that are going to have to happen and we just, we deal with them as we come. Yeah. Um, so that's, those are some things that we have right now. That's that's middle school. That's current cases. Do we have any? I mean, there are any questions about either one of those things or comments? Our, our biggest challenge, the people just not being responsible, sending their kids to school. I, I think I think honestly, I think one of our biggest challenges is, is that students in general are not getting this at the level of what we would expect to, you know, if an adult gets it, they, they, they're they getting it much worse. I think some part of it is there are kids that um, it, they just don't feel as bad with it, right? So this is seasonal time for, for cold, flu, sinus infections, those sort of things. Um, it doesn't present itself the same way. The other thing um, that really has been a, a, an issue is based on CDC guidelines, if somebody begins feeling sick on um, Sunday, which happened, some of our cases um, this past weekend, somebody began feeling sick on Sunday, you have to go backwards 48 hours because they could possibly be contagious 48 hours prior to when they began feeling symptoms, according to the CDC. So our contact tracing has to go backwards 48 hours. A lot of times, somebody will come to school and feel fine. They'll go home the next morning they wake up not feeling well. So they don't come to school while they're not feeling well, but by day two, three, four, they're feeling bad enough, they go to get a test. The last time they were here was Monday and we have to go backwards 48 hours and we realize, so um, a case last night and a case this morning, both people were in school on Monday and felt fine while they were at school, began feeling sick Monday night, Tuesday morning. So when you go back 48 hours, we have, you know, students in quarantine because that person may have been contagious on Monday, even though they didn't feel sick. That's our, that's our biggest challenge, quite honestly. It's not the, I came to school feeling sick. We sent them home and now we've got an issue. Most of the time they don't, it's the quarantine because they don't know they're sick. Um, so is it true that we've been having families send, have, children sick with COVID and still sending other family members. 
Um, no, I think th that is, that's not the case. What, what's the case and what we really need parent, parents to understand is if somebody in the house is not feeling well and you go to get a result, um, the presumption is that you're positive until your test is negative. And so what, what has happened a couple times in our quarantining is let's say mom is sick at the house and is going to get a test, but this children come to school. And then when mom becomes, mom's test comes back positive, then the children have been at school, they quarantine, and then one of the kids becomes sick and you go back in that 48 hour window. And so I, we've had a couple of those where, you know, we should not be coming to school if you're waiting on a test result um, or even sending people to school when somebody in the house is waiting on a test result. Um, those are those are two things we really need parents to to understand. And then the other part of that is some of this is unavoidable. I mean, I think our people have done a really good job. Our attendance is not great. I mean, let's uh, I mean to be honest with you, you know, our attendance is not what we would normally want in a normal year. But that's okay because if you feel sick, stay home. Um, and so um, it, it's also a time for us to refocus a little bit on some of the things that we said before school started when we set out our guidelines, you know, masking to be worn properly. Um, staff members, if you're in your office by yourself, you don't need to wear a mask, but if somebody comes into your office, the person coming into your office and the person whose office it is should, do, should put a mask on. Um, you know, we've had two situations uh, with staff members where they've, they've eaten together in the staff lunchroom and it's a pretty tight space and they're inside of six feet. Um, you know, we've tried to encourage them. If you want to eat together with your peers, go to a classroom, sit further than six feet apart. Um, and, and so just re refocusing ourselves on the protocol. One thing that is positive to note, um, to date, zero quarantined student and staff members have become positive during their quarantine period. So if the exposure was at school, right? Student becomes positive and we quarantine the kids that were in contact with them. The kids that were quarantined for 14 days, to our knowledge, at this point in time, none of them have become positive during their quarantine period. What does that mean? What we're doing inside of our buildings, if we do it properly, works. Um, if we do it properly, it works. And so we need to continue to focus on that you know, that's to date. Um, we, we may have staff members that were exposed last, you know, earlier this week to a staff member that, you know, we don't know, right? But to date, those are some things that um, ha have been true, which I think should be a reassurance to us. What we put in place is working. The safety protocol. Yeah. yeah. And our, our building cleanliness and our washing of hands and the distance that we have, all of those things is working. Um, are working. And so we, we just need to continue to focus on um, doing the right thing. It's easy to let let your guard down. Um, so that's that's where we are currently on COVID update. Uh, we have two days of school next week, and we have three full weeks um, after Thanksgiving, between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And we'll just, we're, um, we have consistently said, unless there's some change at the board level in, in your comfort with this, um, I, we would like, we think it's best for our kids to be in school. Um, you know, obviously we have a middle school who's out right now virtually and hopefully we can stem the tide of this, you know, outbreak as the CDC would call it um, by being away from each other for a little bit. But if it's possible for us to be in person, um, that's the best place for us to be. So that's, that's our plan. Um, unless the board, you know, feels otherwise, um, we'll just continue to monitor our numbers. I mean, are we good with, with where we are? Yeah, we are. Okay. Okay. Good. So that's a COVID-19 update. If something's changed, I'll let you guys know. We update the community as, as quickly as we can. Um, second semester planning, which is related. Um, we had, um, and I'm, the numbers are on the screen here. I'm going to try to do my quick math. Um, we have 194 students who will be virtual for second semester. So um, first semester, we had uh, 323, somewhere in that ballpark, 325 students. Um, 
and 138 of those are choosing to return at um, the semester break to come back in person. Um, 85 of them are choosing to stay virtual. Um, they started virtual, they're staying virtual. 100, uh, 185, sorry. And then nine students who were in person first semester are wanting to go virtual second semester. Um, to concentrate it on any one building? Well, um, we have a we have probably the most concentration. Our middle school class, our middle school classes, we have fifteen, uh, about fifteen students in each grade returning. Um, you know, if you look at, we have four four sections of each of our core classes. You know, that's three kids. Uh, so three, it's not going to affect the spacing of the class. Shouldn't we shouldn't be adding any more than three to four kids per classroom? Um, we do have several grades with larger numbers at the elementary school that we're going to have to do some looking at. Um, you know, Mr. Hayes and I um, will have to talk about the space. Um, you know, in terms of the elementary building, the front half of the building, the oldest part of the building in the front, the classrooms are the smallest that we have in the district. Um, and so right now, our classes are all, you know, 15, 18, somewhere, you know, they're, they're, they're relatively small. Um, which is idea. I mean, it's perfect, right? It's perfect size. But if we bring back 17 kids in one grade level, that's at least three kids to every classroom that we have. And two classrooms are going to get four. So it's another row, right? When you think about an elementary classroom, all facing say that's another row that we got to we got to try to make room for. Um, and so we'll we'll look at that um, here in the next week or so and try to make a decision on where do those kids go. Um, I was really concerned about kindergarten. I mean, I can say this now, but we had a lot of students out in kindergarten and virtually, and we only had nine kids come back, choose to come back in kindergarten, which um, keeps our class sizes, you know, they were they're not gonna gain more than two um, kindergartners, which is, which is good. Um, first grade is a little bit higher. First grade's in some of those smaller rooms. Um, second grade uh, is not as high as first. And then fourth grade, um, is like 17 as well, uh, but that's back hallway, a little bit bigger rooms, and the numbers there were a little bit smaller to begin with. So I think we should be okay um, sitting here on November the 19th um, and looking at our class sizes. Um, we shouldn't need to do anything. What we need to decide now is what's the best way to integrate those kids at the semester break. So, um, so that's that's a little bit of that. Uh, that was the only question I've received this week, by the way, from one of our community members that they wanted us to address is what's it look like for second semester. And so our plan is after Thanksgiving to, to make sure we can communicate that to our families. So that's a, that's an upfront look at it. Any questions about that? Thank you. Okay. Um, that's it, I think, for me. Okay. Have a motion. Um, doesn't need a vote. Yeah, it doesn't okay. need a vote. We're not right. approving it. Good. Okay, we're going to go into uh, executive session. One, to consider the employment and compensation of a public employee or official, and we will have no business after. Okay. Motion? I'll move. Second. Okay. Angela Reagan? Yes. Todd Ireland? Yes. Scott Powers? Yeah. Teresa Wallace? Yes. Suzanne Arthur? Yes. Motion passed five to zero. We're going to go into executive session at 7.52. And there will be no business after uh, executive session. So we're going to go ahead and stop the recording and uh, the live stream. Thanks for attending uh, this evening online. Hopefully everything was good for you there. They'll see it. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email feedback at greenview.org and we can get you those, those answers. So let's have a good evening.